The Open Space Authority is an independent public agency, as many of you don't know, that has protected over 26,000 acres of open space land in Santa Clara Valley. And it operates three preserves that are open for the public 365 days of the year, free of charge for walking, bird watching, bicycling, and for me, hosting personal <laughs> hiking groups that I enjoy every month. Plus, we protect farmland that has sustained a local healthy food source and provided environmental educational programs throughout our jurisdiction, which covers Milpitas, San Jose, Santa Clara, Campbell, Morgan Hill, and unincorporated Santa Clara County. The land we protect serves as a natural infrastructure that in addition to beautifying the places we call home, provides a vital habitat for wildlife, which can be seen on almost every hike that you go on. The natural flood plain and hillsides we protect help recharge groundwater in times of drought, and reduce risks of, risk of downstream flooding and the heavy storm events. And our thoughtful stewardship programs of lands we manage provides an important buffer from wildlife around our communities. But I'd like to mention that during COVID crisis, we've managed to keep all our preserves open and safe. I enjoyed them with my family, so I'm super grateful for those opportunities. And I will tell you that we, we've noticed a greater diversity of visitors with so many consider open space to be essential during this time for, for health reasons, mental health, and it really is a, a key part of, you know, keeping our sanity during these times. We operate on a tight budget of 12 million a year, and two thirds of which comes from Measure Q, which was passed overwhelmingly by supporters in 2014. In the past six years, we've completed almost 300 projects, some of them through grants to community groups in urban areas, all from Measure Q funding. Measure T on this November's ballot is simply a renewal of the Measure Q's $24 annual parcel tax that with no increase until ended by voters. This renewal will allow us to follow through on our commitment to public of keeping our preserves open, perpetuity protect more of our treasured open spaces, and to continue to connect nature in urban communities. And I will end with, I'm being a native of San Jose, I grew up as a child in these cherry blossoms and cherry fields, plum fields, in the beautiful mountain range, enjoyed the rains. And I'm proud that I've raised my five children in these same spaces that I've enjoyed as a child. And it is due to the work of agencies like Open Space Authority and to measures like Measure T that protects land, leaves it open, and gives opportunity for so many communities around our county to enjoy, and many people that come from other counties and other parts of this Bay Area. So I'm really honored today to be here as a board member and someone from this community to really support Measure T. Supporting Measure T does create um, not just protected land that we can all enjoy, but opportunities for diverse communities to have access. Um, Measure T doesn't just help the organization protect, preserve, um, but it also gives an opportunity for communities that normally are not traditionally in these spaces why I support Measure T is because we have to start somewhere. We have to have organizations like Open Space Authority functioning, protecting, and including all of our communities that, that it works in. And I just think it's very important for people to understand how it works, how preservation begins, and the great leaders are Open Space Authority and many of our partnering organizations that work together to protect land. Uh, and, you know, I've been at the state level doing a lot of work in terms of environmental protection. I had a bill, unfortunately, that was stalled this year, um, AB 3030, that would protect 30% of our land and water throughout the state of California. Uh, we're gonna continue to fight for it, but part of the reasoning was that we need um, to protect this open space for the preservation of, of, of a sustainable future for California. And we know that the scientists tell us that we have to preserve our land for our public health. Um, and to decrease the encroachment and, and impact that humans have on wildlife and so on and so on. Uh, I've had other legislation to protect migratory birds that's been signed and passed, legislation to protect our biodiversity uh, in the state of California. Um, but to bring it back to the topic at hand of Coyote Valley, you know, I, I've been with other folks on a journey <laughs> regarding Coyote Valley for a very long time. Back in 2006, 2007, as I was starting my campaign for city council at the time, there were five other people running and out of the six of us, I was the only candidate that was running publicly um, against the development of Coyote Valley. 
And if any of you may recall, at that time, there was a specific plan to develop Coyote Valley, uh, basically to a city the size of Mountain View, you know, 100,000 residents was completely laid out. Uh, and I thought that would be a disaster. And at that time, we fought against it. The economy was going relatively well at the time, so there was a lot of pressure from developers. Uh, uh, but you know, when, when I was able to get into the council and when the recession hit, it gave us an opportunity to really push back and rethink and reimagine what we could do with Coyote Valley and how important it was. And some of you raised some questions. You know, for example, the water table in Coyote Valley is enormously important. And you know, when you pave over it, that's when flooding becomes an issue. Obviously, wildfire protection, wildlife protection. Um, Coyote Valley is a critical uh, land bridge for wildlife from Santa Cruz to Diablo Mountain Ranges. Uh, and, and so the, the other issue that now comes up as we're talking about COVID is we need open spaces for our own personal health, for our family's health. And so as the years went on, uh, we start, started to see kind of the pendulum start to swing. And I uh, was very grateful, uh, and, and none of this happens alone, we all do it together in partnership, but I was grateful when Councilmember Sergio Jimenez followed me with the exact same commitment that I had uh, to protecting Coyote Valley. And, and that was so important because we did not lose any momentum uh, and, and actually increase the momentum, um, especially in the partnership with the Open Space Authority. And we have directors like uh, Fra uh, Director Franco Clausen and the leadership of, of the Open Space Authority. The partnership is so strong between the city, the state, the Open Space Authority, um, Peninsula Open Space Trust, uh, and, and a lot of the different organizations on the ground that that momentum kept building to the point where we started changing a lot of hearts and minds that previously uh, may have been pro-development or pro a little bit of development, even though we know a little bit of development creates that domino effect. And next thing you know, um, it, it really uh, becomes a totally different type of landscape. Um, and, you know, one of, the, uh, one of the things that I was able to work on with the Open Space Authority uh, and the city of San Jose last year in, in support was AB 948, the Coyote Valley Conservation Program. So that was landmark legislation that we were able to work on together to formally recognize Coyote Valley for what it is, uh, the incredibly valuable resource, a natural resource that we need to protect uh, for generations to come. And then this year, Senator Bell, uh, SB 940, created a mechanism for the city to further protect Coyote Valley by increasing density for housing uh, infill development in the, in the more urban part of the city, while at the same time preserving more of Coyote Valley. And so that, that's again where the city, uh, Councilman Jimenez, uh, the mayor and council um, got on board to take further steps to protect Coyote Valley. And so we're in a great place right now, but the reason why we're in that great place is because Measure Q gave us resources to work, uh, get, to give the Open Space Authority, City of San Jose, Post and other organizations, the resources actually buy up land. At the end of the day, uh, the land will not be protected unless it's bought. That's the only way you can protect it. If you just say, okay, well, we're going to just change our general plan and make it zoning for, you know, make it permanent open space. As Sergio knows, any given Tuesday, a different council 10 years from now can say, you know what? We changed our mind. We're going to let so and so factory open up down there because, you know, whatever. Is a, B, and C. We want jobs down there. We want this. We want that. So that's why it's critical that we actually not only have to have things like the legislation to create a conservation program or legislation from Senator Bell to help to facilitate protection. We need the Open Space Authority to have the resources and ability to actually purchase and protect land permanently. That is, that is totally consistent with my AB 3030 to protect 30% 30 of our land throughout the state. It, and that 30% number is not pulled out of the air. Scientists are telling us that. And we believe in science in California. We believe in science in San Jose, uh, in Silicon Valley. And so the scientists are telling us that we need to protect this land. This is actually land that even connects with global warming. The more land you're able to protect, it helps to combat global warming. It's all connected. And, and now with this pandemic, with the wildfires, and this is getting worse every year, we're seeing how human behavior is connected to all of these tragedies. And we can fix it. 
We created it, we can fix it. And that's why I'm so excited about Measure T because we need the Open Space Authority to continue their work. And they can only do that with those resources. And that's why it's gotten, you know, Measure Q was supported. I'm confident Measure T will get the support of the community because especially right now as people are at home and the only respite they get is a walk outside or go to, you know, to, go to these open spaces, people understand more, and ever why, more than ever why it's important to protect our open spaces. So, well, you know, my, my interest in Measure Q, uh, which obviously precedes Measure T, uh, occurred even before I was elected to city council. Um, I was asked uh, to, to, to help support it. Um, and one of the things that I thought about at that time was, well, wh why would I support this, right? Why is this important? Uh, and, and this is coming from me as a member, uh, and everyone has their unique experiences, but my experience growing up was, you know, growing up in a, in a small apartment complex, uh, not having much open space, never have visited uh, Yosemite or any of these national parks or even any of the, the, the larger county parks in the area. And so I know that uh, even today, if we think about it, uh, you know, we're dealing with a lot of uh, challenges as it relates to COVID. And I think uh, as council member, or, uh, council member, assembly member, Kara uh, stated, uh, I think folks are truly uh, appreciated even more so these days, the accessibility to parks and open space. And so, but that's something that's been happening for, for many, many years. And, and so a lot of folks uh, that oftentimes don't have access to these spaces uh, don't learn to appreciate it, right? And so that's why when I was asked to join Measure Q and the committee, a committee that was formed some years back, I agreed to do it because I thought it was important to bring forward a voice of someone that uh, quite frankly had the opposite experience of many of the uh, environmental advocates that maybe have visited and did have access and understood and knew that some of these open spaces existed. And so um, early on, I was very curious if uh, uh, the funding as it relates to Measure Q was really going to be you know, used as effectively as it has been. And I can tell you that I haven't been let down. A lot of the wonderful things that have happened, some of the examples I provided, Marshall Cotto Park, Albertson Parkway, uh, Bill's Backyard, to name a few. And this is not uh, even mentioning a lot of the small grants that Measure Q has allowed the Open Space Authority to give out to many uh, small organizations around the city uh, that, are, that are striving to provide uh, accessibility to nature to many folks. And so uh, that, that has been my experience in working uh, with the folks at the Open Space Authority. And that's why I thought that uh, jumping on board and supporting and endorsing Measure T was, was super important. The other thing that I would say is that... Um, I think that we, what we need to do as an environmental movement, as people that care about nature and our sustainability as a planet and, and preserving mother, mother Nature and protecting it, we really need to bring into the fold folks in the community that often aren't in this space, right? That I think care naturally about the environment. You know, I'm, I'm from Mexico. I was, I was born in Mexico. And I can tell you that a lot of Mexicans don't consider themselves environmentalists. But if you ask us if we care about the land, we will say yes. We, we spend our days, many people in California spend our days tilling the soil, planting the, 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 the food that many people eat. And so we care about the land. It's just providing that space and that opening. And I, that's why I think uh, the work done through Measure Q and now that's going to be done, I believe, through Measure T is so important to bring people into the fold and include them in some of these decisions and better understanding how uh, preserving our open space and, 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 and opening these up uh, these channels of, of uh, better understanding and quite frankly, loving uh, open space is very important for our community. We're all responsible for creating a better future and a better city and a better county for our residents. Uh, and so I think Measure T gives us one of those tools in order to, to expand those opportunities for the broader community, for the diverse community. And so, no más quiero decir que todos en mi mente tenemos la responsabilidad de hacer todo lo posible para abrir estos espacios y la naturaleza para los residentes de las ciudades y el condado de Santa Clara. Y pienso que la medida T es una de esas herramientas que podemos usar para abrir estos espacios para las familias y, y las personas del condado que, que sabemos que necesitan estos espacios. Gracias. So, when we think about this from the perspective of health, um, we often think about a doctor's office, we often think about a nurse or a hospital, but health is really a state of well-being and not just the absence of a disease. And, that, and that's really informed by the context that we live in, um, that we work in, that we play in. Um, and when it comes to nature specifically, 
um, we know that it has effects on not only our physical health, so being yes physically active, but our mental health, our social well-being, um, as well as the environmental um, uh, environment, uh, uh, health as well. Um, and so we know that research demonstrates uh, spending as, as little as uh, two hours a week uh, in uh, a nature in green space, uh, that's about 15 to 20 minutes a day, can uh, improve uh, self-reported health and well-being. Um, and that nature is an essential part of the public health infrastructure. Uh, being outside improves uh, uh, health outcomes. Uh, when we talk about physical activity, um, when people who are, live closer to green space are more likely to be physically active. Um, and physical activity is a mechanism to prevent uh, any sort of chronic disease, whether it's hypertension or obesity. Um, and um, it's also a way to really uh, protect our mental health. Um, so, for example, physical activity among older adults uh, is linked to delaying the onset of cognitive decline. And we know that that uh, group of, uh, of individuals was particularly impacted um, uh, by the pandemic. Um, and when we think about mental health outcomes, um, uh, it, it's, it's not just mood, it's not just stress. Um, but that psychological distress, there was a study out of Australia about, uh, of more than 45,000 people um, that, who lived closer uh, to green space, um, and in particular the, the tree canopy coverage, were significantly linked to the experience of, of decreasing psychological uh, distress. So what does that mean for society in this context where, where we are experiencing a pandemic? Um, well, um, it's being outside uh, for a significant period of time was during this lockdown phase um, was sort of the the last bastion of socialization and we as uh, human beings are social social creatures uh, we were struggling with a, a growing epidemic of loneliness and social isolation before the pandemic hit um, and it became even more important as we were able to physically distance, parks became even more important as we were able to physically distance outside while still being within a safe uh, environment. Um, and it's not just sort of experience on an individual level. We know that social capital, perceived social capital in, in communities, you know, 27% of that is attributable to differences among parks. Um, and these, these factors, as we think about not just our individual health and our social health, but the environmental health, um, is that parks, green space are really helpful, not just are, are really helpful in from the perspective of air quality, uh, improving air quality, and as well as uh, serving as a way to, to reduce urban heat island effects. Um, a study here uh, outside of uh, Baltimore, in Baltimore and in DC, found that um, parks were about 17 degrees cooler uh, in surrounding neighborhoods, and that the cooling effect actually extended um, up to half a mile uh, outside of the, that park area. So, you know, we've laid out sort of study over study um, and, and really identified that this has uh, an impact on health and well-being, but this is also a, a factor of equity and, and justice. Um, uh, nationally, uh, we did some analysis in-house in our organization and found um, that uh, parks uh, that serving primarily non-white populations are half the size of uh, those serving majority white population and are about five times as crowded. Um, and so that, that equity piece of it really has to be central in how we're approaching access, how we're approaching quality of these spaces, as well as how we're approaching inclusiveness, um, as was referred to, to earlier today. We know that parks are going to be, uh, parks and green space are going to be critical um, when we think about recovery, when we think about resiliency, um, and really are these factors that, that unite us as we, um, as we spend time in nature to, to soothe and console us in a rather distressing time. We see now more than ever land being used um, uh, being as busy on a Tuesday morning as it is on a Saturday afternoon. Um, and I've heard that directly from park directors. Um, and in that context, we have to understand that land and, and parks and green space is an essential part of public health infrastructure. We have to get away from a philosophy of nice to have and really embed it in a philosophy of a must have to ensure healthy, um, livable neighborhoods for generations to come.